Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our No Fail Friday today, your mainframe encryption and safe harbor, what's changing. Today we're with Jeff Cherrington. Uh, he's going to take things away. So all you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, folks, thank you for joining us. Joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your appropriate time zones. Uh, this is the next in our continuing series of No Fail Friday, focusing on mainframe security in the enterprise. And this, this month, I'm looking to talk about some things that are changing around uh, the use of encryption in Safe Harbor in at least a couple of uh, specific areas, that is the U.S. state regulations as it pertains to Safe Harbor for data breach disclosure, and then the U.S.-EU Safe Harbor provisions and how they've changed with the recent um, introduction of the EU General Data Protection Regulation. Um, very excited to have you here. Uh, I hope you'll find from this that as we talk through discussion that I'll set a stage that gives you an incentive to stick around for the end of the discussion. I am going to give a brief history to kind of put things in perspective and then talk to some specific changes that are impacting Safe Harbor and what it means for the mainframe. Uh, we do have a Q&A period at the end. It is going to be a, a bit of an asymmetric Q&A. You do have a Q&A box available to you through the WebEx, so please uh, use the Q&A box feature to submit questions as they occur, occur to you during the session, and I will answer as many as I can at the end of the session. So please start pulling those in. Uh, I may answer some as we go along, and we'll try to get to all of them at the end. So. I think it's always important. Every every meeting should have a purpose. Uh, if you folks invest your time, I want you to walk away feeling like the time was was worthwhile. And and the reason why I think you should stick around is that the mainframes handle more regulated data than any other part of the infrastructure. And if your experience has been like mine in the industry, that means that the mainframe gets an inordinate amount of regulatory scrutiny. Mainframes are the, the primary switching engines for uh, payment transaction processing, as an example. Uh, they're becoming more and more important in dealing with the Internet of Things. They are increasingly the uh, server that's doing the largest amount of bulk processing within major enterprises. And it has been for a while. And as a consequence, because of data, data privacy regulation, uh, encryption has been a strategy for reducing both regulatory audit interruptions and their expense when it comes to a compliance, as well as actually materially protecting the data for a long time. Uh, encryption has been a regulatory and a literal um, safe harbor for this regulated and sensitive data. However, regulatory changes are eroding safe harbor, change is required, and I hope through this discussion you'll walk away with some things to, to consider as you plan forward uh, about how to posture, position for your regulatory compliance for reducing the intrusiveness of, of audits by external regulators or, or even internal audit uh, officers and be in a better position to, to go forward. So real brief history uh, that sets the stage. Um, some of you, like me, may look at a picture, such as you see on the right, and, and recognize it. Um, my early career was in a data center exactly like this one. I, I still fondly remember the, the tape racks and uh, throwing platters on the machines. And it was a time when the mainframe was an isolated silo of computing. There was not a great deal of connectivity. Uh, most of the communication outside the data center ended up being through blue bar, green bar reports, and things of that nature. And that's changed significantly. Now the, the mainframe sits on the, the data floor uh, connecting 
to other servers as a peer. Uh, it may be the most securable server in the data center, but it is just another server, the most powerful, most reliable, most available server on the floor, but it is a part of a community in a way that it was not previously. And to contribute to your company's, your enterprise's value generation requires that it maintains pervasive connectivity. It's connected to so many other servers, through so many other connections, always available to enable that free flow of data, which we know has led to, to tragic consequences in the past. And because there was not enough attention paid to anticipate those consequences, it's led to escalating regulation, more audits, more controls, and complying with those regulations, responding to the audits, is consuming larger and larger portions of the IT budget. Um, our executives at CA Technologies have been speaking to senior executives at your organizations, at, at other of our customers, and one of the things they came away from this summer is that as much as a third of IT budget is going toward regulatory compliance these days. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an onerous percentage of the budget when we all have goals to help our organizations compete effectively in the market to increase our revenue or increase our margins by reducing costs. And so consequently, thoughtful approaches to how we can limit the amount of effort that we've got to apply toward regulatory compliance and to uh, audit uh, response is, is worthwhile. In the day that we were, we were dealing with this initially, if I think back through my career, and, and I'm sure recollections that you share, um, as we entered the, the era of the, the Internet, the, the use of the web back in the late 90s, uh, we started seeing all of the difficulties that organizations had controlling payment card data, controlling personally identifiable data. Um, there were not good controls in place and, and frequently because, as in the case with payment card data, um, the people, the, the organizations who were holding the data were not necessarily the, the organizations that would feel the pain, suffer the financial consequences if that data was breached, if a retailer uh, allowed a 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 credit card numbers to be compromised, it was the credit card companies that extended the unsecured credit to the cardholders that suffered the pain and not the retailers themselves, and that generated so much regulation, the very early days of the visa uh, CISP, if you recall that, the predecessor to the existing payment card industry data security standard, very intrusive um, as that industry tried to get itself pulled together. And one of the, the comments from the time is we've got to do something. Something has got to stop this madness of both data breach and the severe impacts of new regulatory requirements, new audit requirements uh, around data privacy protection. And so the voice that came forward is we need a safe harbor. Safe harbor is not a concept that's unique to data processing or to data privacy protection. Uh, safe harbor is a generalized concept. It's provision in any statute or regulation that's specified if certain conduct is, is achieved or presented, then the individual or entity in question will not be deemed to have violated a given rule. As, you know, essentially, if you satisfy the safe harbor requirements, it's like sailing your ship into that quiet harbor away from the stormy sea insulating the entity in question from the penalties or the punishments of a statute or a regulation. You know, an example outside of, of perhaps our industries 
is that here in the U.S., if you obtain a Phase One environmental site assessment when you buy a piece of property, then uh, you are protected from being uh, penalized or litigated against if some future contamination is identified and was caused by a prior owner. It protects you perhaps from some of the Envir environmental protection penalties or Superfund obligations that you might have. And Safe Harbor is a part of all of the U.S. state regulations around data privacy um, breach disclosure. There are data breach notification requirements in 47 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, Guam and other uh, of the island protectorates that in different ways with different languages and with, with different uh, potential penalties all revolve around the idea that the personally identifiable information of the taxpayers of a state must be appropriately protected and if it is not and the breach occurs that notification to the impacted individuals must occur. That's actually a lot more onerous than it sounds in just the, the phrasing. Um, if any of you have had to deal with those, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar. Um, I worked for a good number of years in the payment card industry. And even before the data breach laws came around, there would be events that would require notification. Um, even back in the 90s and the 80s, I recall, there would be an error in data processing as an example, and uh, an incorrect interest rate would be applied or an incorrect fee would be applied, and whenever that occurred, we were required to notify all of the impacted individuals by mail of this. And I, I remember that we knew to the tenth of a penny how much each notification would cost. And just the notification itself of creating the, the content, the, the text that goes into a letter that's going to be sent to somebody who's impacted, um, the, the legal vetting and the, and the business review, the actual printing of that letter onto the appropriate form or stationery, folding and inserting that letter, and then actually stamping it and mailing it it, it, even back in the 90s, it was, it was more than a dollar per notification, even before any other, any, any other expenses were added. And so if you have impacted 10,000 or 100,000 or a million users, the, the fees for that notification alone could become very, very large. And now when we talk about the world of electronic commerce, the um, implications of data privacy protection here, the, the expense has gone way up. Um, even, even within non-commercial organizations, it's become a standard that if a data breach occurs uh, that compromises personally identifiable information, the entity responsible for that um, will extend um, credit um, protection or identity theft protection um, to those individuals. There's a, a recent example where uh, the details of six million um, registered voters in the state of Georgia were compromised. And the state of Georgia extended the opportunity to all six million of those registered voters the I, uh, to to pay for <clears throat> excuse me to pay for uh, identity theft protection, and that's not inexpensive. Uh, buying retail now, one off. If I were to do it over the the internet, or you were to do it over the internet, it might cost as much as a hundred dollars or a hundred and fifty dollars per year. And while situations such as the one I just described for state of Georgia might go and uh, benefit from some volume purchase agreement, it's still not a trivial expense. And so consequently, organizations take these data disclosure laws, these data breach notification laws, very seriously because they do have both direct financial implications as well as 
uh, implications for reputation, uh, damage to brand, and the cost then that is associated with attracting and retaining customers. And an interesting side note, as I was doing this research, one of the things that I, I learned and I had not heard is that a number of the states are now beginning to incorporate the payment card industry data security standard, PCI DSS, directly into their data breach disclosure, disclosure regulations. Uh, PCI DSS in a lot of ways has become one of the significant best practices around managing data privacy. And of course, their focus is the payment card data itself, but the practices themselves are, are universal in how they can be applied, um, particularly including the application of encryption for data protection. Yeah, a little bit of a side note, I, I digressed just a little bit earlier talking about the dynamic of data protection and retailers who have payment card uh, numbers and that the compromise of those payment card numbers managed by the retailers didn't directly affect them but impacted the, uh, the card issuing banks. It's an interesting uh, statistic from, from the history now of, of both payment card, the Internet, and our use of technology that from 1988 to 1998, the entire credit card industry um, showed a $750 million uh, fraud loss impact due to compromised payment card numbers and such. Um, in, I believe it was 1998, it, it might have been the year after, but with the introduction of the internet, the, the pervasive use of the web, and the um, emergence of online retailing, that number jumped to $10 million a year uh, in, a, in an extremely um, punishing inflection uh, on the curve. Um, the, the point of all of that being that with the pervasiveness of our use of personally identifiable information over the, the Internet, with the use of our personally identifiable information for more and more things that are critical to our personal safety and our personal success, it really is an obligation that the, the industries have to observe to better protect that, um, protect the data over which they have uh, control. And here in the U.S., um, the, the state regulations around data breach disclosure or notification are focused on the taxpayers, the citizens of each state. But the jurisdiction, the, the extent to which these data breach disclosure obligations go, don't stop at the state line. If you take a look at wording of the, of the different statutes, they say it's not just if you are a business within the state of Georgia or the state of Illinois or the state of California, it is if you manage the data, the personally identifiable information of citizens of that state or do any type of business within that state. And the consequence then is it, it is challenging because since most organizations do business broadly, certainly many of our enterprise customers are at least nationwide, if not broader, they end up having to comply with the most onerous of all state regulations in expectation that that gives them the, the greatest uh, opportunity to uh, address all of the regulations that any one state would have. And to the, the good purpose then, uh, if 47 states plus the, the District of Columbia and others have data breach disclosure laws, at least 31 of them extend safe harbor to compromise data if it's encrypted. So you know, the, the, the law may say you must disclose a breach and then offers an exception except when the data can be confirmed to have been encrypted. It gets a little murkier, though, once you start taking a look at the specific details. So 
we, we have to recognize that reg, uh, regulators to a degree and legislators to a much larger degree are not necessarily technologists. Certainly there are some, some uh, legislators and, and elected officials we can point to as very good uh, technologists with a, with a solid background, but for the most part these folks are not technical. And so consequently we see that U.S. state legislation related to data breach disclosure uh, is phrased in legal language and not in engineering specifications. And I have, I have here on screen um, a typical example taken from the Illinois code related to their data breach notification um, statute. And if you read through it, um, it says that personal information as defined here um, is as far as data breach disclosure is concerned, is is any of the named elements of username or email address and, and password, the security question, that's not encrypted or that is encrypted but that the keys to unencrypt have been compromised. You know, we we, we, we can we can wander through the uh, the density of legal language for a long time, but the point of it is this is the level at which things are currently defined. Encryption is never given a technical specification. And there's probably some very good reasons for that, and we'll, we'll expand on that a little bit as we go forward. It is important, though, to lift out that the states are perhaps less sophisticated in this area than the federal government. Um, I've, I've gone through a number of the, the 47 states statutes, and, and the sort of language we see here is pretty typical, for encryption is never defined. But if we compare that then with the wording that is in the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, as, as most of us are familiar with, it gets to a much lower bit of granularity in the specification, saying it must be an algorithmic process to transform data into a form in which there is a low probability of assigning meaning without use of the confidential key, and that key has not been breached. That, that's closer to the sort of specification that we as technologists might look at and, and understand what sorts of encryption or algorithmic process would meet the test and those that would not. And that leads to just a, a brief detour. Um, and the detour is meaningful because it's going to frame some of the changes that are happening with the way legislation is dealing with encryption and with safe harbor. And it's something that I think we all intuitively know but perhaps don't always explore. All encryption is not the same. Um, I've, I've had the good fortune to work in this area for a couple of decades now. And what I find is that encryption and cryptography generally are, are highly technical domains, that's somewhat obvious. Uh, the underlying math, uh, the maths that are used with, with prime factor, uh, prime number factorization for an example to derive public-private key are, are arcane at best. It, it takes a fairly significant investment in time to understand the underlying math. And then beyond that, once the algorithms are defined, there are subtleties in implementation which make it um, even more complicated and complex to manage effectively. And what, what that leads us to is that all encryption is not the same and a lot of weak encryption that many of us may have worked with through our career is now subject to cracking with work factors within commercially short periods, hours or days. Commercially here, more in terms of the business of crime and, and data compromise than, than in terms of commercial for valid and um, legitimate purposes. Um, payment card numbers or personally identifiable information that might be used for identity theft is interesting to criminals who are wanting to use it fraudulently if they can get to it in a short period of time. It takes weeks or months 
to obtain it once they have uh, a, a body of data, a, a data set or a file, then it becomes less interesting, both in terms of their their length of time to return on investment and just the utility of the data itself, since uh, all, all data of this nature, payment card and personally identifiable, um, the value declines over time. So if we think about our careers, we know at one time the uh, data encryption standard DES was considered adequately strong and if we protected with DES, we were doing what we needed to do. But as processing power grows, as the speed of the CPUs has increased it in, uh, increased in cycle time, as our use of technology has increased in terms of parallelization, what was strong becomes weak. Uh, it's the implications of Moore's law. And that's made things a lot more challenging both for our legislators, legislators and for our technologists. And that's something we're going to expand on as we, as we come back off the detour back into the main road of our discussion. You know, it would seem then from looking at the state law, as long as I encrypt, I'm good to go. There is the wrinkle, though, that is called out in both that example of a state statute for data privacy um, breach disclosure from the state of Illinois and in the language from the federal HIPAA uh, regulation. And that's that we must keep our encryption keys and more importantly the decryption keys appropriately protected um, and make sure that they are not shared. Once the keys become shared, then the commitment, the guarantee, the, the confidence that encryption is actually offering data privacy erodes. That, that's a whole area of, of discussion that's, that's worthwhile on its own. Um, certainly, if you have interest in this area and you'd like to see it presented on a No-Fail Friday, um, use the, use the Q&A box. Let us know. Uh, we'd love to know what you guys and, and gals would, would like to see more of on these Fridays. But I will recommend that if you're going to be at CA World this year in November in Las Vegas, I invite you to hear a great discussion about cryptographic key management on the mainframe um, and the use of encryption across platform that will be given by PK Ware's CTO, Joe Steronis, and um, my, my, one of my close co-workers, um, the uh, CA Mainframe Security Vice President of Product Management, Stuart McCurbin, called Encryption and Hashing and Keys, Oh My. So if you're going to be at C CA World, look for that as uh, an expansion of this very brief discussion here. So here we are, we're a half hour into the discussion. That's a long wind up. So what's changing? So there are some things that are changing that are significant. There are indications of a shift in U.S. state and local regulation, at least, regarding encryption as safe harbor. Right now, generally we can assume if I'm encrypting my data, that data gets compromised, I can demonstrate I've encrypted it, I can avoid the cost of data breach, I don't have to do notifications to state's attorney general, uh, I don't have to notify the public. However, Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam signed Tennessee Senate Bill 2005 on March 24th of this year, which went into effect on July 1. The bill did a couple of things, but but specifically it removed the word unencrypted from the Tennessee Code that related to data breach disclosure. And that has some pretty profound implications. So taking a look at the wording, it, it modified one particular section of the code and now strikes the word unencrypted and therefore breach of a security system means unauthorized acquisition of any computerized data that materially compromises security, confidentiality, and so on. It was interesting to listen to the replay of the introduction of the Bill of the Floor, the discussion of the sponsoring state senator, and, and additional commentary, because what it reflects is legislators are not technologists. 
And this particular change is a reaction to their understanding that, as we said, not all encryption is created equal. And two, implementing encryption even when strong can vary greatly with outcome, in outcome from enterprise to enterprise. The, the federal government has done some damage to the whole area of encryption and its interpretation for safe harbor in the recent events we saw around their work to decrypt an iPhone during the, uh, the terrorist attacks um, in which the terrorist iPhones were recovered. I think everybody probably has heard that media, uh, that has, has been exposed to the media during that period that there was the appeal to Apple to decrypt the data on the iPhone, and Apple said, oh, no, we can't possibly ever. It's technologically impossible. And within a matter of a few weeks, the federal government, the FBI, came back and said, oh, okay, we, we figured out how to encrypt, be encrypted on our own, unencrypted on our own. So with the understandings about the technology that are shown in those, those couple of bullets at the bottom of the slide, with the understanding that, that strong encryption may or may not be something that can be defeated with enough uh, thought and uh, capability and um, uh, processing power put against it, the, the people who are not technologists are beginning to struggle with, well, if, if I'm obligated to protect my constituents, can I always depend upon encryption as something that is sufficient to guarantee that protection? And at least in the state of Tennessee, that's no longer the case. Um, the state of Tennessee is the first. We're already, we're already beginning to see similar conversations developing in other states. And so consequently, this is an area where we expect there's going to be a great deal of change. Equally, there are federal regulations that are anticipated to have some very direct impacts on how encryption can be interpreted for safe harbor. Um, it, it, is a, it is a dangerous world in which we reside, and in dealing with the guerrilla attacks of terrorists here in the U.S. and elsewhere, um, there, are, there are movements within federal legislation that are looking to undermine encryption as protection for data privacy. Um, it's in the best interest. Uh, right now, Senators Richard Burr and Dianne Feinstein, uh, as recently here as last April, introduced a draft of their proposed Compliance of Court Orders Act of 2016, um, which, sounds, which sounds great. Of course, we should, we should comply with court orders. But the very specific wording is that it's going to require technology companies of all types to be in a position where they can decrypt customers' data at a court's order. Think about that. Essentially, they're saying to all the technology companies, you must have a back door to anything that's encrypted. And once you introduce a back door, you've got a back door. And therefore, trying to testify that encryption that's been applied is not subject to compromise becomes much more much harder. It goes back to what we said earlier about key management. Once you share the key for decryption, you've got a wholly different situation in terms of the diligence that has to be gone through to make sure that any of those shared keys is not being used maliciously, fraudulently, or carelessly. And so if this federal regulation goes into place, that'll further erode encryption as a safe harbor for data privacy. And then we come to the big safe harbor. Um, EU safe harbor is actually labeled just that. And for those of you who deal with multinational organizations that, that are dealing with data that goes back and forth between the U.S. and the EU, uh, you're, you're likely familiar with this. It's, it's an extension or, or the implications of the EU Data Protection Directive of 1995, 
which was implemented just ahead of that inflection in the, the curve in the use of Internet and uh, online retailing and online identity theft and such that we talked to earlier. But it was in place as we hit 1998, 1999, and through negotiations, the U EU and the U.S. worked out a set of, of rules of engagement that would allow U.S. companies to continue to exchange, maintain, and process the personal data of U EU citizens in 2000. And, and Safe Harbor has been in place since 2000 and, and has been the basis by which companies like, um, uh, well, any of the large in a cloud-based data processing companies or the large cloud-based retailers could retain EU citizen personally identifiable information, name, address, phone number, national identifier, payment card information without being in violation. It was relatively straightforward. U.S. companies could self-certify on 15 frequently asked questions and seven principles that would allow them to process and, and manage the, the EU data managed by the Department of Commerce and, and things have been largely stable around that for a while. But as our general manager of the mainframe business unit, Ashok Reddy, recently noted in, in his blog, Shields Up, Securing the Mainframe for EU-US, big changes impacted Safe Harbor this year. Essentially, Safe Harbor is no more and is replaced by a, a new, more stringent set of principles that were enacted under the EU General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. And you see in bold font the headline. Um, I wanted to get to it quickly. I want to make sure it's called out directly. Uh, there are some very long, very sharp teeth involved with the EU GDPR that by extension applies to U.S. companies or other nations' companies that are doing processing of EU citizen or taxpayer data, up to 4% of their worldwide revenue or 20 million euros. That's a big difference. So the, the GDPR replaced the previously existing uh, European Data Protection Directive. The directive was like advice, you should go do this. Now GDPR is you must go do this, and it's got some very, very big penalties backing it up. The good news is it does share a lot of characteristics with the safe, uh, the previous Safe Harbor Agreement, uh, its seven principles. Um, essentially, you can continue to rely on encryption as a safe harbor for data disclosure. I might also mention um, the new GDPR has data breach notification provisions in it, just like we were talking about for the U.S. state laws. Um, but now a U.S. company that allows EU citizen data to be compromised can be obligated to send notifications to them in their home country and at, at, at their homes um, it's something that the previous safe harbor uh, did not provide for at all. Now, though, encryption can be that safe harbor from both the, the monetary penalty, from the data disclosure penalty, but it's not the same as it was. The, the specification around encryption is more specific. There's a large number of additional data attributes that are now considered personally identifiable information. Um, much more frequent testing and documentation and attestations. In this element about increasing the number of personally identifiable information attributes is, is one that's going to catch more than a few enterprises by surprise, we, protect, we, we predict. So as we, as we look toward coming to a close here and going to our question and answer, um, uh, what are some takeaways? Um, Encryption for regulated, da regulated data that's not in use or that is in transit remains the best practice, at least for the moment and, and likely into the future. We do need to be very thoughtful that we're only applying strong algorithms, which means more than single key three devs. Uh, those of us who are, are involved with this stuff, we know that 
one key, three DES, is actually the same thing as DES and therefore does not provide any additional strength, but two key or three key, three DES is still considered strong. AES um, is actually the current best practice for almost all uses. And we need to ensure that decryption keys are securely stored by as thoroughly and easily auditable me a mechanism as we, we apply our encryption. We also need to anticipate that there will be new regulatory volatility at the U.S. state level, at the U.S. federal level, perhaps even internationally, that's going to impact data privacy protection again, or, or maybe we should just say still. But we do expect to see that there's going to be a spike. There's going to be a bit of a inflection uh, elbow in the curve. So case one, if you're dealing with the data of any of the citizens of Tennessee, you can no longer rely on encryption of safe harbor. And by the way, I didn't explore this here, but also take note that you must report data breaches really, really promptly. They've got a fairly onerous data breach uh, notification um, period that has to be observed. You also need to take into account that any company, if your enterprise is exchanging data with any EU-based entity, you're now subject to GDPR if there's any personally identifiable information and therefore could be liable to those extraordinarily uh, penalties that are described. And we've all got to take note of what might happen with changes in U.S. federal law as the dynamics between personal privacy protection and homeland security become into greater dynamic tension. So our recommendations, be prepared for the, these changes in ambiguity. That means that you, you need to be staying close with your compliance people, uh, need to be working with them to, to understand what terms are changing when it comes to what describes adequate protection of data so you can continue to enjoy safe harbor from fines, prosecution, or data breach notification. Um, you need to review, we all should review, our use of encryption to make sure that we're using the cryptographically strong algorithms at current cryptographically strong key links and ensure that the implementations that we're using are uh, appropriately vetted, such as AES that is compliance with, with the uh, FIPS, with the Federal Information Processing Standards uh, it's 140-2. And perhaps most importantly, make sure that all of your cryptographic configurations are thoroughly documented and that documentation can be quickly provided on need. And it's also important to think forward about reducing exposure of the mainframe both to attack and to regular, uh, regulatory scrutiny by ensuring all of the regulated data is found no matter where it is, no matter whether it's part of our production, ongoing systems, which we probably do protect pretty well, or if it's contained in stray, lost, abandoned, um, orphaned data sets on the mainframe, make sure they're found, classified, and appropriately addressed to avoid the unfortunate consequences of accidental and malicious exposure. And certainly, if you have interest in this area, we encourage you to take a look at our CA data content discovery. Um, CA data content discovery was aligned with the fact that as we think about safe harbor here in the U.S. or with the EU, the mainframe still transacts 70% or more of the world's mission essential data, including uh, personally identifiable data of, of all types. And with CA data content discovery, you can automate scans to find regulated or sensitive data on your data stores, no matter what type they are or where they are, classify them in terms of the sort of personally identifiable information they are. Uh, we are certainly continuing to expand that list as we get a better understanding of what now constitutes personally identifiable information under the EU general data protection uh, regulation. And then once you've identified them, you can protect that. So hopefully you'll find something useful there as you consider this. Um, CA Data Content Discovery, we, there's a web page for the product and in the upper, uh, I, I, actually the middle left, right at the very top, there's a nice link to a video 
that does a two-minute introduction of the product and what it does. If you have uh, interest, you want to know more, please reach out to us here at CA. Reach out to me directly, Jeff Charrington, at CA.com. Um, we'll be happy to provide more information. And with that, then, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, see if we have had any questions that have come in during the session. So it does, it does look like there's been a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one of them is, is asking if data has been encrypted with a uh, not considered strong encryption algorithm now today, uh, but it was encrypted several years ago, is there any grandfathering that gives uh, safe harbor for data of that nature um, within the, the different regulations that apply? And, and unfortunately, the answer to that, I think, is, is pretty directly no. You know, the good case example is as we think about U.S. state regulations, it says the state citizen and taxpayer personally identifiable information must be protected. And if we had a data set that included social security numbers, which are valid for the life of the taxpayer, that was encrypted with DES or with uh, Blowfish or Twofish or some of the weaker algorithms uh, a number of years ago, and that data set becomes compromised, it probably would not be considered uh, completely protected and would not be eligible for all of the, the existing safe harbor provisions wherein um, encryption is allowed. Um, with that, I think, Ben, we'll close. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Uh, we look forward to having you join us on new, uh, on future No Fail Fridays. Certainly let us know through communities or directly to me. Um, or others you may know in the mainframe security group, if you have additional questions or topics that you would like to see addressed in these sessions, we do this for your benefit, and we hope that you, you walk away feeling like the time has been well invested. With that, Lynn, I, I think, I'm sorry, not Lynn, but uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you can, let's go ahead and close out the session and uh, and move forward. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great weekend.